When I was at school, we were given beautiful powder paint in little cones of colour in bun tins to paint with. We loved the colour and we were told not to spill it. When we added our brushes and water and painted it on our paper, it seemed to die. The sculptor Anish Kapoor, perhaps influenced by the piles of dye you see for sale in the markets of the East, has noticed this powder paint, this pigment, as sculpture and has left added to it a vast range of sculptural forms. This sculpture is called, As If to Celebrate, I Discovered a Mountain Blooming with Red Flowers. Anish Kapoor is the master of a wide range of unexpected and sensual shapes and textures. very simple and obvious question is what is it and in response to that one isn't saying it is a then one has an answer and that's the end of that hopefully the things remain puzzling for long enough for one to really wonder what they are and what sort of relationship with the world they have in a sense it remains elusive It wasn't perhaps till after I left art school that I began to feel what was really important was things that came out of growing up in India. It's a vital link. It's also probably vital for me to be away from it. Um, much of, in a certain way, much of what I do is um, um, about things partially revealed things hidden. Maybe this notion of being away is a way of, of having something partially hidden in that sense. I think one of the things that I've always been very, very interested in in Indian life is the way that ordinary people have some kind of relationship with a particular shrine or a particular temple. And mostly, they're very simple places where there is actually just a stone or one image. And yet, the reverence with which they look upon these places is unbelievable. The sculpture happens in a time before the world is created. Um, when um, Brahma and Vishnu are arguing about um, which of them is the supreme deity and um, out of the, this um, void, because nothing is created yet, there arises this um, linga, phallus, of, of, of light and um, neither Vishnu nor Brahma can understand what that's um, what this phenomena is. So um, Brahma takes his form as the Ganda to fly up and see if he can find the end of it. And Vishnu takes his form as the boar and dives down to see if he can find the bottom of it. All of a sudden, the linga bursts open and Shiva manifests himself as the supreme deity. 
the, the, the mythological event represented, to my mind, isn't represented. It's actually taking place. The stone is growing. It's expanding upwards and downwards. Um, if one could speak of it in terms of um, pictorial imagery, it's much more like a, a motion picture than it is like a painting. So it's that notion of an event taking place which is, uh, for me, very important about this piece of sculpture. And um, it connects then with one piece, I would say, of, um, of modern art. I'm thinking of Brancusi's endless column, which stands and extends out of the earth into the sky and down into the earth again, displaying the same kind of phenomena, which carries over into, into my work. The story or the event that takes place isn't um, narrative, but is actually um, happening. Here, it seems to be, in a certain sense, phenomenological. Earth and stone and sexuality. So these are the stuff of, of living. I feel it's very important that work should, for me, in, in my own private way, function such that it has a very strong relationship with, what, with, my, with my inner life, with what's going on inside me. And um, this whole thing about hands and the physicalness of making this thing and the fact that it's wax and it's hot, and um, it has this kind of bodiness which seemed clear. There's a traditional notion of sculpture, especially in, in Britain, which is um, very f concerned, we're formally concerned with um, the way that a, one part of a sculpture relates to another part of sculpture formally. Uh, I don't find that interesting. I see myself as an artist, and um, some things happen three-dimensionally, and other things happen two-dimensionally. But the edges blur. try to be, in some shamanistic way, a medium to somehow reach, and there are some things that do it and some things that don't. I made the work in my studio out of blocks of polystyrene, which Somehow I was thinking I was thinking of stone very definitely, but um, I didn't want to be making models. I found a way of making polystyrene in a sense do what stone does. It has this kind of granular consistency. It carves in a very similar way too. So I made some forms, ordered the stone. I knew what size it would have to be. And with the stone masons, we cut the stone down to size. The difficulty then, once the stone's cut down to size, is how to not interpret something that's been made already, but how to experience it again. It's a difficult thing to do. I think I had to do it because of the scale of the work, really. If one was making something much smaller, then it's possible to just make it in stone immediately. It's good to have one or two outside views that one knows are going to be critical, sometimes at the right moment, often at the wrong moment. One work, too. Yeah. And then I was thinking one, two, or three. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the look, imagine it here. It'll come out down there and out to about there. That's We've got right. all that space there. Well, I think it's about here. In making the show, I've been conscious of the space that it's going to go into. 
although I think and I hope that the work defines its own space, um, the scale of this space is very important. So I have a picture in my head, I think, vaguely, which will change. I think, in a sense, it's rather like making a work, making a, a show. The way the show hangs together um, is not dissimilar from the way a work hangs together. We have this doorway here, through which almost the whole show is seen in one view. Now, um, that's a little problematic because I would like the show to be an experience through which one, one wanders. And somehow I've got to use that and not let it be a disadvantage. This show happened, I didn't make a show. I think what I did was make a series of works over quite a long period of time that came together as a show. So in a sense, as the works were discoveries for me, so the show is a discovery. Light is very important to um, the way the sculptures are seen, and I wanted to control it. Rodin, when he showed his sculptures to people would often put all the lights out and light them with a candle. And this is a void lump of earth. And um, in the shape of the hole, there's obvious references to fecundity and the mother and the earth as a place of origin. Well, I was talking for a specific color of earth because um, it matters. Well, it's very hard to find good, clean earth in London. So I eventually bought it from a garden center. I always thought I was going to be an engineer. Well, I was at college for six months or so, and I just knew it was not what I was, not for me. I then lived on a kibbutz for, in Israel for a couple of years and had a little studio. I'm very involved with, and have been for a long time, with haiku poetry. Now, there's a particular poem by, by Basho, which goes something like this. Breaking the silence of an ancient pond, a frog jumped into water, a deep resonance. At first, this poem is very casual. It describes the world in a few short lines, and it does very little. I think there, in a sense, is relationship with material. It is stuff of the world, um, in a sense, quite ordinary. But the ancient pond is um, a reference for the mind. Frog jumping into water is a way of speaking of an awakening. So by describing the world, what Basha is doing is also arriving at a symbolic level on which things function, which is quite other. So it suddenly takes a shift. It's suddenly not a description of the world. I would like the show to have a deep sound. That's all I want, in a sense. You know, just a, a kind of quietness. I'd like it to be as hermetic as, it, as possible. Perhaps that is religious. I think it can be that kind of experience, so I'm going to try and make it that kind of experience. I'm 
the moment not too concerned about what anybody else thinks. Barnett Newman used to say that um, criticism to the artist is what one apology is to the birds, which I think is great. If only one could be that strong. That's, I think that's one of the battles of a lifetime. Thank you.